Um, but thank you, Andy. Thank you so much for that. I, I realize that some of you will be more interested in the paper that I'm not going to give tonight than the paper I am going to give tonight. So the paper I'm not going to give tonight is the question of why I have this absolute certainty that Chaucer had read the Decameron more closely than most people. This is, anyone who's worked on this problem, this everyone knows is an old question that's been argued about for a long period of time. Um, I, I sent the manuscript into Carolyn Palmer. She sent it out to a reader, and the reader said, well, you know, some perhapses and maybes would be a nice addition to this particular argument. And I was, of course, furious. <clears throat> the reader also said, if he wants to pursue it in this way, he might want to call it something crazy like the origin of the Canterbury Tales. And I thought, great, that's the title I'm going for. So, so the book really does argue in no uncertain terms that Chaucer had read the Decameron more closely than many others. And here's what I'd like to rest the case on. I'm going to do this in a way that will be more intelligible to the Boccaccio scholars here. I'm not going to carry you through all of these stories. So we can come back to it in questions and answers if you'd like to. But the evidence is on the board in front of you. That picture, this one up here, is a story from the Decameron that has never been discussed in connection with the Shipman's Tale. This is Decameron 810, and it's the story of Salabetto, a Florentine merchant who ends up in Palermo, is seduced by a local courtesan. She takes him off and to the bagno, and things happen. The story continues from there. It's an absolutely brilliant story. It's a wonderful story, but no one has ever thought about 810 in relationship to the Shipman's Tale. So here's my argument. Uh, the ones that everyone has thought about are 81 and 82, the first two stories of the Eighth Day of the Decameron. And they've always assumed that 81 and 82 are retellings of a common folk tale. The a uh, lover's gift regained is the way that folklorists refer to this. A2 is the traditional telling of this. It's set in Varlungo. It unfolds the way most folk tales would unfold. A1 is the one that's closer to the shipman's tale. It's set in Milan. And it involves a merchant, excuse me, a mercenary borrowing money from a merchant and returning it to the wife when he sleeps with her. That's the one that comes closest to the shipman's tale. But 810 is really fascinating. 810 is the same story, but no longer set in a village or in a city, but now set in the world of international commerce. It's set in Palermo, and it's set with merchants and bankers, and the world unfolds in that way. But it is the lover's gift regained. How do you get your money back? What Chaucer saw Boccaccio doing is taking one folk motif and setting it in three different places. And the story changes because it's set in those three different places. What Chaucer did, seeing that was to recombine those three economies back into the shipman's tale. So we have the feudal world of the monk who shows up with his gifts to ingratiate himself into the family. We have the world of Saint-Denis, which is where the shipman's tale is set, a kind of urban environment. But what's so cool about that story is that the merchant goes up to Bruges and then back down to Paris in order to transact a a deal that works in this new international economy. So we have Chaucer not using perhaps one or maybe two of Boccaccio's stories, but seeing what Boccaccio did in writing these stories and recombining them down into one, that to me is better than any verbal parallel that you can come up with. That becomes pure evidence for a close reading of the text. So that's the paper I'm not going to give on. On the other hand, we have some great authorities, and they're smiling at this moment. So I may have gotten through the first part of it. I've lost my glasses. <clears throat> Let's see if I can give you the paper I intend to give you. Um, 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 um. What I'd like to highlight tonight is a related question. So how, what does Chaucer get out of the Decameron? which has, I think, an equally significant conclusion. My main point is that the wife of Bastail, 
And remember that Chaucer wrote two tales for the wife of Bath. He wrote the shipman's tale first, and then he wrote the wife of Bath's tale. We know that the shipman's tale is for the wife of Bath because it has those female pronouns at the beginning of the whole thing. But I want to focus on the second tale for the wife of Bath, not the shipman's tale. And I want to argue, the main idea I want to argue of today is that Chaucer created here a new narrative from two strikingly different ideas. This is what he learned from Boccaccio. You don't retell stories. You take ideas and form them into new narratives. This argument obviously fits into the larger claim of my book that Chaucer learned how to write this way from reading the Decameron. And so I will refer to some other evidence by discussing the Miller's tale. But a main focus on the Wife of Bath's tale will take me beyond the origin of the Canterbury Tales to show how it became, the Canterbury Tales became the source for other works. In this case, I'm going to argue that the Wife of Bath's tale is the direct source for Gower's tale of Florent. Literary history, Andy? Enough, maybe? There'll be a date or two in this, so we'll see what happens. In any case, um, as you all know, let's see if we can move through this, the old view about the relationship between the two tales, which can still be found in the chapter by Witherington and Field on the Wife of Past Tale, is that both rely on common oral traditions, making any precise discussion of the sources impossible. But recently, Russell Peck has argued that Florent was Chaucer's immediate source, which, of course, is more likely because the first version of the Confessio Montes comes out in 1390. There's a date. Well, Chaucer left the Canterbury Tales unfinished in 1400, so it's more likely that Florent precedes the wife of Bastille. So establishing the wife of Bastel as the source of Florent would advance literary history, indeed allowing us to date Chaucer's tale to before 1390, and so place it at the beginning of the Canterbury Tales. Uh, but I'd like to begin, however, with the Miller's tale, which will allow me to correct a mistake and refine a point that I made in giving a lecture at King's College London last fall. My reason for doing so is to introduce the main claim of this evening's paper. Chaucer did not retell stories, but rather constructed new narratives from ideas. The mistake is quickly dealt with. It concerns the person that he learned this technique from, Boccaccio. But I was wrong to suggest from this image that Oriel College got ripped off when it bought only five rather than six Tuscan poets. The one without a hoodie, for anyone who doesn't know, is Boccaccio. My source for my mistake was this, which seems like a reputable source to use. I found it on the internet, so why not believe it? And I've heard of Oxford. Um, it seems reputable, but if you go to Oriel College, this is obviously what you'll see. So my apologies to the provost and fellows of Oriel College. I bring it up not because I was hoping you were laugh, but I was hoping you were laugh, but to, to make the point that history, including literary history, can go wrong, but it also can be corrected. Now, the, the next point, the revision that I've got to make out of the King's College paper is a little more complicated, but I think more significant. <sighs> Slow down. At King's College, I argued that Ganoff, used in the description of John the Carpenter at the opening of the Miller's Tale, is a brillig word. So, Willem there was, a dwelling at Oxenford, a rich Aganoff that guessed his hell to board, and of his craft, he was a carpenter. My claim was that it's a Gnoff is a brillig word, which explains the image. Or perhaps, should it be this one? In any case, I'm trying, I am trying, okay? My claim is that Gnoff is a neologism used by Chaucer to introduce a major theme of the Miller's Tale. And that theme is our need to question even our most instinctive judgments. Now, that's a little tricky, so let me unpack this. I think all of us know the difference between the real and the Harry Potter versions of Christchurch Hall. 
And if we were to think about it, I think we'd agree that language works in much the same way. As fluent speakers of a language, we immediately recognize words we don't know or have not heard before, and we often judge these words to be new. But the question is, how do we, as non-fluent speakers of Middle English, distinguish a new coinage by Chaucer from a poorly attested but real word? So the point, I found that in discussing this problem, I found that two words are really helpful to clarify this for people, brillig and chortle. So my question to you all, is brillig a word and is chortle a word? So um, most people, when asked that question, would say no and yes, making it the right answer for a synchronic linguist. But a historical linguist would note that Carroll created both words for Jabberwocky. Chortle is first used by Lewis Carroll in Jabberwocky the same way Brillig is. So my claim is specifically that Gnoth is a Brillig word, one created by an author for a particular purpose, but which did not actually then become part of the common language. Now, the stakes of this are pretty high. I'm claiming here that Chaucer didn't just borrow words from French and Latin, but in fact, he created new ones, and that Gnoff is one of those creations. But the way I think to pursue this topic will allow me the way to pursue it by broadening the discussion from isolated words to the phrase, twas brillig and rich Gnoff, will allow me to make the point that these neologisms drive their narratives. Let's start with Jabberwocky. I like this print. Is it legible? Not, but I'm sorry. My apologies for that. Here's my recollection of Jabberwocky. Twas brillig, or you all know this? Do we recite it in unison? Twas brillig in the slithy toves, did gyre and gimble in the wabe. All mimsy were the bar groves and the momraz outgrabe. Beware that jabberwock, my son, the jaws that bite, the claws that catch. Beware the juju bird and shun the frumious bandersnatch. He took his vorpal sword and hand, long time the mansome foe he sought. Then stood he under a tum-tum tree and rested a while in thought. And while in uffish thought he stood, the jabberwock with eyes of flame came whiffling through the tulgy wood and burbled as it came. One, two, one, two, and through and through the vorpal sword went snicker-snack. He left it dead, and with its head he went galumping back. Twas brillig, and the slithy toves did gyre and gimble in the wabe. All mimsy were the bar, go bar goves, excuse me, and the momraz outgrave. I'm sure there were other mistakes in that. It's hard when you've learned a poem a long time ago to correct it for a learned audience. In any case, my interest here is in Twas Brillig. And what's interesting is that we both know what it means and we know that we cannot know what it means. Twas is a cliche. We know exactly what it means and where we're likely to find it at the beginning of a conventional poem. In contrast, I think we recognize at some level that brillig can't be a word because ig, ig, is not a productive suffix in modern English. Uh, so it's not just that it lacks a context like that of chortle, he chortled in his joy, to tell us what it means. Um, the ig means that it can't be a word, it can't mean something. But of course, it could in Old English, as the pair holig and modern English holy show. Or of course, the, uh, the common ending for the date of singular of the word for a fortified place uh, turns out to be the source of many of the endings in Y that we know in things like Canterbury. My point, brillig, twas and brillig work together to identify not the hour of the day when, as Carol tells us, one begins to broil things for dinner, but rather a distant fictional past, indeed an Anglo-Saxon past. Now, I think this is an interesting reading, but you guys are going to say, how about a little evidence? 
Here's the evidence. Harvard now houses Mishmash, the last of Carroll's hand-lettered magazines produced for the amusement of his family. I've enlarged the lower right-hand corner, but it, it's not as clear as I would expect. Croft, 1855. That's where he was writing, and that's the date. Of course, through the Looking Glasses, 1871. So he publishes the first stanza of Jabberwocky, 16 years before uh, Through the Looking Glass is published. And what's cool about this is that he publishes it under the title Stanza of Anglo-Saxon Poetry. Now, there are some problems here, as um, particularly in the definite articles, which I doubt Carol found by going to Wikipedia. But this article does show the ye form from his day. It's a 1792 above ye old mint. In any case, even vaguely aware of this temporal clue, some scholars have turned to English history to find the source for this poem, and so enter the Stockburn and the Lambton worms. The first is connected with the Cottier's falchion on display at this moment up in the kitchen of Durham Cathedral. The second is described in greater detail in the kind of uh, kind of publication that might have inspired Mishmash. I really don't want to go too far down this rabbit hole this evening, but I do think that these popular legends, as well as a Victorian translation, The Shepherd of the Green Mountains, of a German poem from about this time, same time, are indeed sources for the poem, sources for the Tolgi Wood, the Eyes of Flame, and most obviously the Vorpal Sword. But it appears to me that they lack, he left it dead, and with his head, he went galumphing back. For this, we need, well, the Anglo-Saxonists would tell us we need Beowulf. Now, the Kimball translation, galumphing back with a head, that's in your upper left there, in case it's not as clear as it should be. Uh, the Kemble translation of Beowulf appeared in 1837. Carroll, of course, arrived in Oxford in 1851. He kept journals. He kept really good journals. And there's no mention of Beowulf in any of the journals. Although I should remind you that the last three months of 1855 are missing from the Carroll journals. So it's possible they might be there. Um, but there are numerous references in his journals about the need to study Anglo-Saxon, his desire to know more about etymology, and one entry for 13 March 1855, he decides that he needs to read White. Now, the Carroll scholars haven't been able to figure out who White is, but in fact, he's got to be one of Andy's predecessors in the Bosworth Rawlinson chair. He's got Professor of Anglo-Saxon, Robert Meadows White, who held the chair for five years beginning in 1834, and his edition of Ormulum, 1851, begins with a survey of Anglo-Saxon scholarship that mentions Kemble's edition in Beowulf. My point, twas Brillig, announces Jabberwocky as a remarkably early parody of the great Anglo-Saxon epic, not unlike Carroll's playful turning of Milton's verb boots, as in, alas, what boots it with uncessant care to tend the homely slighted shepherd's trade and strictly mediate the thankless muse. What, obviously what he does in this joking illustration is he takes the boots, which survives in the phrase to boot. He was a dreadful bore to boot, right? We know that phrase, although the etymology is a little bit more obscure to us. It's of course Old English, tol bolta, as an advantage. Carroll knew those kinds of etymologies. He cared about them, and that's the point of that particular play. The details of literary history tell us what happened because suddenly the texts that matter to us make a little bit more sense. They're funnier anyway. So let's go back to Chaucer um, and very briefly to the Miller's Tale by way of this Richa Ganoff. Luckily, we can overlook one particular example of this rare word because it has been explained brilliantly by one of your own in a learned publication as being a fake 
a common bit of photoshopping. So I'm very grateful for that bit of research that takes that Ganoff out of the picture. We can turn back to the OED and Ebo, where there are 15 examples in early modern English of Ganoffs. 15 and only 15 examples. Now, these are significant because they suggest that although the word Ganoff appears in Middle English only in the Miller's Tale, it was actually part of the language. At King's College London, I made two points. All of these 15 examples occur during a 70-year period when it was widely believed that Chaucer's English had become incomprehensible. And a significant number of them are found in the kind of educated writing associated with antiquarian interest in Chaucer's words, works, excuse me, at places like Oxford, Cambridge, and the Inns of Court. Tonight, I'd like to add one more point. In three of the examples, we find specifically richer Ganoffs. And in a fourth, rich is used in the immediate context. In addition to this, seven more of these Ganoffs are associated with wealth, often with the idea of being a miser. Now, I think you'd all agree that there's no reason for a Ganoff to be rich other than the phrase's prominent use in the beginning of the Miller's Tale. So let's think about it. Like Twas Brillig, the phrase is memorable because it both poses a problem and then answers it, even if we're not fully aware of that answer. A richer Ganoff, that, that Gestus, so John is a richer Ganoff that Gestus that is, his social superiors held to board. My question here is, who has power? Who's in control in this situation? Um, taken together, I think, the phrase and the following tale, the Miller's Tale, are a powerful challenge to the conservative views of the knight, according to whom knights have power because they're knights. The Millers' Richard Ganoff asks us to question the inevitability of this conclusion by playing this linguistic game with us. It's a word we think we know, but we don't really know. This is the idea that's driving the Miller's tale. This is the idea behind the Miller's tale. And to repeat, my book argues that the source for many of the Canterbury tales are not existing narratives, but rather ideas like this. This is what Chaucer learned from the Decameron. So in my remaining time, um, what I'd like to do is turn to The Wife of Bass Tale and show that it's a remarkable example of this way of composing, meaning that, if I can borrow the knight that I've been using to represent Chaucer's opening tale and apply him instead to Florent, the order must be this and not this. It's got to be the wife of Bath first rather than Florent. In any case, I think we'd all agree that the wife of Bath's tale and Florent tell the same memorable story. A knight who's gotten into trouble, and of course one of the differences is in the wife of Bass tale, it's because he's raped a lower class woman. In the tale of Florent, it's because he's slain in combat, the son of a prominent family. In any case, in spite of that difference, this knight who's gotten himself into trouble is told he can save his life only by discovering within a year's time what women most desire. He learns from a lovely lady the answer, sovereignty, which saves his life. But she then demands as a repayment that he marry her. When he refuses, she offers him, on the wedding bed, a choice. And again, the choices are different. We'll come back to them. But when he allows her to make that choice, she then becomes his beautiful wife. That's the common plot between the two of them. It makes sense to think of it as a folktale. But if you start looking at it, and Russell Peck did, you'll find out that there really are only two other examples of this narrative. One is the wedding of Sir Gawain and Dame Ragnall in this Bodleian manuscript. 
And the other is The Marriage of Sir Gawain, which exists in the Percy Folio in the British Library, additional 27879. I, the British Library, as you all know, doesn't allow us to pull out our cameras the way the Westin does at this point. I don't have a picture of it, but, but both of these are later manuscripts. These are obviously later traditions. As Russell Peck noted, both of these are likely to descend from some combination of Gower and or Chaucer. But of course, Russell Peck then goes on to claim that it was Gower who did it first. Now, one kind of evidence that supports my claim that Chaucer created the story and Gower then retold excuse me, retold it, is external. There are, as Peter Nicholson counts them, 150 tales in the Confessio Amantis, but only one, the Tale of Three Questions, might show Gower using popular traditions to create new narratives. Most of his tales, as you all know, come from obvious places, often Ovid or the Bible. In contrast, almost half of the Canterbury Tales could come from popular sources. So the odds are that it was Chaucer who created this story. But I think internal evidence turns out, I think, to be even stronger than the external evidence, because it doesn't just support this idea. I think it offers proof. So let's turn to the popular traditions that make up this narrative. Again, we're back in sources and analogs, and this is according to Witherington and Field. The tale is written from two folk motifs, a lonely lady and the question of what women most desire. I'll begin with the second, what women most desire, but you'll see in a moment that I don't think it's really the right question to begin with. In any case, what is it that women most desire? I don't know, obviously. No, still no laugh, sorry, <laughs> hopeless. <laughs> sorry about this. In any case, what is that women must desire? It, the, the blank slide is intentional and is also used to introduce my claim that it's the wrong question to focus on. The Wife of Past Tale is so familiar to us that we readily accept the idea that this question is widespread in popular tradition. But if you go back to the index of folk motifs, Thompson's index of folk motifs, aside from Chaucer Florent, the wedding and the marriage, there are only two more examples of it. One is how Gowen wanted to know the thoughts of women, interpolated into a Dutch <coughs> translation of the Lancelot legends in a manuscript in The Hague dated to 1320 to 25. If anyone wants to come back to the dating of Dutch vernacular manuscripts, I'd love to go there. But in any case, I'm not an authority on this, so we'll pass it up at the moment. The story, we can work from the story. Upset when he's told that his lady will not be faithful, Gawain asks the queen if she has any clear knowledge about the thoughts of women. So there is at least a question, but notice it's not what is it that women most desire. The queen turns around and says, nobody may know it, so varied is their thought. So Gowan obviously sets out to find out what the answer is. So he takes it as a still unanswered question. He doesn't find an answer in this particular text. There's no sovereignty that will appear. The second example that you find in the index is Arthur and Gorligan, a Latin romance found in one manuscript in, of the late 14th century or early 15th century. Here, we don't even get a question. Arthur begins a journey after he's been told by his wife that he has never understood the nature or mind of a woman. Now, these quests could reflect the question, what thing it is that women most desire, but neither actually contains it, and neither contains the answer sovereignty. If we pull them out of the equation, the remaining four look even more certainly related. And I think even with them, it's slender evidence for a widespread folk motif. And here's my point. It's the wrong question to begin with if you're looking for the origin of this narrative. As you all know, The Wife of Bath's Tale ends with a different but oddly similar question. 
The lovely lady asked the rapist knight which he would prefer, to have her ugly and faithful or beautiful and unfaithful. This question, as Margaret Schlauch explained long ago, rests on a long-standing misogynistic tradition. I'm going to hit the button. The long-standing misogynistic tradition that comes right up to the Daily Mail. My daughters find this slide offensive and said, Daddy, don't use it, but here it is. According to the Daily Mail and science, beautiful women are never faithful, okay? So it's a long-standing misogynistic tradition. But notice what Chaucer does and doesn't do here. He's working out of this tradition, but he doesn't repeat it. Instead, he explodes it by having it asked by a woman. Okay then, guys, which do you want? This is the question that allows the tale to be written. The quest to discover what women most desire simply reverses it in order to emphasize it. Now, this kind of reverse, I think, is characteristic of the tale. My favorite example of it is the scene in which the rapist knight confronted by the need to marry an old woman, suddenly discovers that his body is more precious to him than everything he owns. She, uh, uh, sorry, this knecht and sweared, alas, and wail away, e wot reeked well that switch was me behesta. For goddess love has chased a new request. Talk all me gold, and lot me body go. Right? It's, it's brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant. The question, beautiful and unfaithful, or ugly and faithful, when similarly reversed, becomes, what is it that women most desire? So my first point is that the two questions work together in Chaucer's tale, and so it's telling that Florent has only one of them, and not the more foundational. It's loathly lady ass, fair by day or night. Moreover, even the first question fits awkwardly into Gower's tale. When hearing the knight's answer after he's come back to the court to explain to the people who have sent him out to find the answer to what thing it is that women most desire, when, so when he answers this question, sovereignty, the grandmother in the court attacks not the knight, but the loathly, excuse me, yeah, but the loathly lady. She said, ha, trezun, woe they be, that hast thou told the privete, which all the women most desire, e walda, that thou were a fira. That's bizarre, you know, it just doesn't make any sense. What it does, I think, though, is sets us up to look again more carefully at what Chaucer does. So here's the comparable scene. The rapist knight comes back to Arthur's court, and he's asked what the answer is. And here's his answer. Me liege lady generally, quote he, women desiring to have sovereignty as well over her husband as her love, and for to ben in maestri him above. This is yora mosta desir. Though ye may kill her, doeth as you lister, e am here at your will. That's a brilliant answer. The knight couches his answer, which he might have learned word for word from the lovely lady, in the claim that the queen could kill him. But if she did so, she would abuse her power, proving that his answer is right. I think it's just cool that, that it works that way. And it then carries over into the following uh, response. So it's not the queen who speaks, but in all the court, no was there weef no maida, no widwa, that contrary that he said, but said in he was worthy on his leave. The women's communal response is not that he's right, but that he's not wrong. Again, we return to the question of rape, the abuse of power. If the, I failed on every joke so far. I'm gonna try one more, okay? Maybe not. If that's the question, if it, rape and the abuse of power is the question, then the answer is empower women. There's no doubt that that has to be the right answer to that. 
But if the question is not rape, if it's many other things, then many women will come up with different answers. There is a famous riddle in Old English called the onion riddle, which might suggest that there might be other answers to this particular topic. In any case, it plays itself out in Chaucer's tale in a way that holds together these points in a way that Florent doesn't hold it together. So let me recap. Aside from four related texts, we have no evidence for the question of what women most desire. Instead, we have a widespread misogynistic tradition that accounts for the final question in The Wife of Bastail, but not in Florent. And it's that question which underlies the earlier what, what women most desire. It's possible that starting from something like the quest in the Dutch Gowan interpolation or Arthur and Gorligan, Gower created the question of what women most desire. And Chaucer then repeated it while improving on the logic of the story by tweaking the second question. But I think you'd agree this is much less likely and becomes even more so when we turn to the locally lady. So who's the locally lady? This slide's okay. This slide won't offend anyone. On 23 April 1392, in a letter to the Academy, Whitley Stokes identified her when he found the source of the Percy Ballad in medieval Irish texts. She is, of course, the Irish sovereignty goddess who appears to the potential successors to the throne as ugly, an ugly old woman who then becomes young and beautiful when she and the rightful heir sleep together. Now, to put this discovery into context, let re me remind you that it was in 1812 that the Brothers Grimm published the Kinder and Hausmärchen. In 1846, William Toms coined the term folklore in a letter to the Athenaeum. And in 1910, Arnie's first version of what we know as the Arnie Thompson types of the folktale appeared. My point is that folklore is on the rise. So it's not at all surprising that when G.H. Menander's 1898 Harvard dissertation and his following publication of 1910 put Stokes's discovery into this context, setting out the possible roots of oral transmission of the story from early, perhaps fifth century Ireland, uh, through Scandinavia, Wales, Germany, and France into 14th century England. The map, again, was an attempt at humor. Um, here is the key point. During this long transmission, according to the folklore scholars, the story evolved from being about a king becoming a king by sleeping with a goddess into one about how a knight learns to behave toward women. This view, Menander's view, I think has been tweaked by later scholars, but I think it still holds in the minds of many, including Witherington and Field, as essentially true. It's still essentially true. But what is it that Stokes called attention to? If you read the fine point, what he's interested in is, first and foremost, a 14th century manuscript, the Book of Ballymote, written, in fact, in 1391. And being Stokes, he went on to survey the other manuscripts of this. So the red are from the 14th century, the green from the 15th, the blue from the 16th, and the purple from the 17th century. Some of these manuscripts contain more than one version of the story. Now, in one sense, there's absolutely no surprise here. This is simply the relative survival rates of Irish manuscripts from these different periods. But it also makes the point that although the story of a sovereignty goddess who became young or who becomes young again when she sleeps with a new king almost certainly did originate in pre-Christian Ireland, I think that's true, this story had remarkable currency in the 14th century and beyond. What I'm proposing is that Chaucer heard that story and used it in writing The Wife of Bastail. Heard it from a speaker of Irish or from someone who knew a speaker of Irish and then worked from it. 
And again, I'm not going to stop. There's a historical context for this. On 13 October 1385, Richard II bestowed the land and lordship of Ireland on his favorite, Robert de Vere, ninth Earl of Oxford, the same guy who approved Chaucer's 17 February request for a permanent deputy controller of customs and subsidies. So Chaucer worked for de Vere. He would have cared about this. De Vere becomes King of Ireland. De Vere had been made Marquis of Dublin in December, a marquis being a new title that gave him precedence over all other earls. And the October promotion raised him to Duke, the first person outside the inner circle of the royal family to hold this title. As the DNB, Dictionary of National Biography, puts it, De Vere's powers were enhanced so that the king retained only his liege homage for the lordship. The other image, of course, is De Vere fleeing Radcot Bridge in 1387. There's no indication that he ever intended to go to Ireland to rule. However, he was granted 500 men at arms and 1,000 archers to enforce his claim. This transfer of sovereignty was then reversed in 1386 when the appellant seized power. Although, obviously, in the late 14th century, English foreign policy was directed toward France, the war with France, for a brief period in 1385-1386, the years in which Chaucer is beginning to start thinking about the Canterbury Tales, the sovereignty of Ireland must have been the hot topic. I'm claiming that Chaucer heard the story of the sovereignty goddess and decided to put it together with the misogynistic commonplace that a beautiful woman is never faithful. The shared idea, how does it look from the other side? Not that of the king rapist, but rather the goddess woman. And so let me offer in a few seconds a quick reading of the wife of Bass tale that falls out from these sources. The wife of Bass tale, the, it begins with a rape. And like all rapes, this rape begins in the denial of speech, the refusal to hear no. The story, though, progresses, and through its lengthening female speeches, the tale insists on the right of women to be heard. It ends, I admit, problematically, with the rapist knight married to an obedient wife. And Juan the Knecht, so this is the very end of the tale, they're in bed together, she's offered him the choice, and he says, you make it, she becomes beautiful. And Juan the Knecht saw verily all this, that she so fair was, and so young thereto, for joy he hent her in his armest woe, his heart to bathed in a bath of bliss. A thousand timaru he gan her kiss, and she obeyed him in everything, that nicht don him plaisance, or the king. Now, obviously, it's those last two lines that are almost impossible for to make sense of for any feminist reading of this text. She obeyed him, right? But look at the line that precedes them. His heart uh, bathed in a bath of bliss, right? We're back here. What Chaucer is alerting us to is the fact that the following lines are going to take us back into the mind of the wife of Bath. So what follows? And thus they live it to her leave ascenda in parfait joy. And Jesu Christ ascend, a husband is maker, young, and fresh abeda, and graced overbeat him that we wedda. And eke pray, Jesu, short here leave us, that nacht will be governed by here weave us, and old and angry niggards of dispense, God send him sooner, very pestilence. Here we are back into the mind of the wife of Bath. The story doesn't end, but it circles back into the prologue of the tale, another of Chaucer's remarkable experiments with sources and reversals. The point it makes is that maybe nobody should rule in marriage, but the right wife of Bath certainly should rule in the debate on marriage. She speaks first. Men may respond, but even the Franklin's tale has to circle back again to her. 
arguing in its own way for the end of the oppression of women. Here I think equality and women's right to speak is a radical message. Both ideas, the Irish sovereignty goddess and loathly lady, and the misogynistic tradition linking beauty to unfaithfulness were needed to write this story. Gower, who apparently didn't write this way, had at most one of these things. So he must have been adapting The Wife of Bastail, which must have been written before 1390. So <clears throat> there are, of course, two places we could go from here if we had more time. What did Gower do? How does this fall out in the relationship between Chaucer and Gower? And how does The Wife of Bastail fit into the development of the Canterbury Tales? I talked about the last at last year's Kalamazoo and the other, the second one, I'll get to address at this year's uh, New Chaucer Society meeting in Toronto. And of course, anyone who wants to can bring them up in questions. But for now, let me end with this. The details of literary history allow us to see how the wife of Bastail is a spectacular example of what Chaucer learned from Boccaccio. These original authors reached out for Brillicks and Ganoffs, sovereignty goddesses and misogynistic traditions, wherever they might find them, and then used them to shape original narratives that express new ideas. Or, as Humpty Dumpty tells Alice, the question. The question of words and stories, but not according to the radical message of the wife of Bass tale in marriage, the question is, which is to be ma which is to be master? That's all. Thank you.